Hi, I'm John, the Banking Systems Engineer, Termel, and lesson number 38 is an article on Argentina, a report by Keith Hart, and uh, explains a bit at this point what's going on and some of the interesting factors and things that were happening. Liquidity, cash and circulation became even more scarce than usual, and provincial governments issued their own money as interest-bearing bonds. I forgot to mention the non-interest-bearing bonds that worked just as well. Uh, he says, the Argentino was proposed as the nationalization of these provincial currencies, not in the form of bonds, but as a paper paying no interest. Well, that wasn't so bad. Paper with no interest? Yeah. But then it also makes it centralized so it's easier for them, for them to shut it all down. So, anyway, he says it was hoped that this measure would provide interim purchasing power while the government worked out how to devalue the peso without triggering off hyperinflation. So, always worried about the federal interest bearing money while there's an ocean of interest, 80% interest free money. They're worried about the 20% interest bearing money. But who would buy money from this government? The idea was quickly dropped. Okay, so the provinces kept their own provincial bonds, I hope. So who would work for this currency, the guy asked, um, that pays national taxes? I asked. Everybody would. Everyone wanting to pay national taxes would work for it. But they weren't interested in getting work in exchange for their bonds. They were interested in getting cash in exchange for their bonds so they could exchange for local work, right? The feds, they didn't want to get work by paying directly with the bonds. They wanted to sell the bonds for cash, promise interest, to then pay for the same work. Just another way of raping the voters and the taxpayers with interest. So, ordinary citizens floated their own social money in the late 90s, forming an association, Red Global de Truque. And Red means network, so global network of barter. Solidario Global Solidary Barter Network, which issued 15 million currency units, creditos. So the RGTS credits are a single issuer script, like the national currencies that they aim to complement. They are given away or bought cheaply as tokens of exchange within a closed circuit. Now, what does he mean by bought cheaply? How do you buy an hour bill cheaply? For half an hour? Here's a half an hour bill. Give me an hour work. For 50 minutes, here's 50 minutes work, give me 60 minutes. How do you buy 60 minutes cheaply? These and the provincial government experiments in local currency are a response to the rigidity of the fixed dollar exchange rate which squeezed the life out of the domestic economy when profligate debt and capital flight made devaluation inevitable. So when the other system broke down, provincial bonds and social currencies, interest-free, took over. So these experiments in interest-free currencies are a response to the interest-bearing death gamble currency, mortgage, that squeezed the life out of the economy. What do you expect when the mortgage contains the word death? So he continues, before dismissing this case as the old story of third world economic failure, it is worth recalling that around 1900, Argentina had the sixth highest per capita national income in the world and was considered to be a potential rival to the United States. And imagine being able to hobble such a rich, powerful nation into being a beggar with the money system. So the desperate attempts by Argentinians to maintain a market economy in the absence of liquidity evokes nothing so much as the social credit movement in North America during the Great Depression. Absolutely correct. And the only way Bible Bill Eberhardt blew it was that he tried to issue it, his money, and call it money. And that allowed the courts in Ottawa to declare that only Ottawa, the feds, have the right to run money. Therefore, your provincial money would be unconstitutional and it is banned. And all he had to do was say, look, it, if I got a right to bring a million dollar bond to New York to get money at, say, 10%, do I have a right to bring a half a million dollar bond at 10%? Yeah. Well, do I have the right to bring a half a million dollar bond at 5%? Yeah, if you can get it. Well, can I... Try and get a half a million dollar bond at 0%? Yeah, if you can get it. Well, can I try and sell somebody a $10 bond at 0% if I can get it? Yeah. So there was absolutely nothing wrong with printing small denomination bonds. And it was when I saw that 
Eberhardt had failed, and I saw that end run that I came up with the idea of using provincial bonds as a currency that I brought to the IMF meeting in 1982, got busted, and it got into the hands of the Argentinians who were first to put it to use. So, provincial bonds, that's true. So, <clears throat> yes, it does. People banding together to fight their financial oppression using social credits or sociable credits. Credits are only sociable when there's no interest. Nice to see someone else notice the parallel since social currencies are social credits too. We have already seen that Argentinians have started creating their own money at several levels of society. Well, that's true. We know the we know the people are creating social currencies based on their time. We know that the provinces are issuing bond currency that people can pay their taxes with. And we heard that the feds are issuing their own new pesos to pay for stuff, backing up the pesos that people can use to pay their taxes with. So every level of Argentinian society started dumping good money into circulation. Yes. So, uh, just, just, okay. <clears throat> This is just one aspect of a worldwide movement to set up community currencies, which has been growing of strength late. And all they got to do is adopt the time standard of money, and they can all intertrade. That's why when I went to Europe, all other nations over there, when you stayed in Germany, they charged you five hours per night, 100 green marks, which was equivalent to 300 green francs in France, five hours per night. So when I went to Europe, 39 nights out of 40, I paid with an IOU for a night back in Canada worth five hours, approximately 60 Canadian dollars. Worth five hours US, approximately 50 American dollars. How about the price of a motel? So I owe 39 nights of accommodation and only had to pay for a motel with cash once. Good stuff. So, uh, da -da -da -da. so. This is just one aspect. Community currencies point to a fundamental reassessment of the conditions for economic democracy contained in relations between states, people, and money. So with the end result having to be a worldwide time trading unilet network someday. Inevitable. So he says the essence of state money is that currency of little or no worth is offered to a people by the government in payment for real goods and services as the sole means of exchange within the territory and with the obligation to pay taxes on all transactions using it. Yeah, but also the ability to use it to pay taxes with. And what does he mean, money of no worth or little worth? The moment they say you can pay taxes for this, the moment they paid the man to fix the road with this money, this money became worth the fixed road. No such, and you want money to be cheap. You want money that costs very little because it's not the token that's valuable, not the medium, it's the exchange. How can anyone say that currency we can pay taxes with is of little or no work worth? Currency we can pay taxes with is the most and the best worth. And that was completely wrong. So, he points out Genghis Khan pioneered state money as worthless script. Oh, I hate that when he calls the... Anyway, when he issued a currency made from a special bark imprinted with his seal. Whoa! I said, I wish he'd quit calling the king's IOU worthless script. When everybody can pay their fair share of taxes for the secure state that King Henry financed with his own interest-free tallies. Oops, oops, we're talking about Genghis Khan with his own interest free, whatever they were called. The story is true, and I keep forgetting to mention this great abolitionist of loan sharking to the kings. So I'm going to add two more lines to my poem bank.htm at my johntermel.com website. Genghis Khan made money from a special bark with seal financing, financing public works. No one refused to take his deal. Okay, Genghis Khan gets credit for being a great abolitionist and building a great kingdom on interest-free financing. Like the original Romans when they used the... That's what made them strong originally till the loan sharks got in and sapped them. So, he says, Refusal to accept Genghis Khan's money carried the death penalty. An impressive public works program, including a new capital, was financed in this way. Oh, you had to keep, take the king's IOU so he could build you better roads. And if you wouldn't take the king's IOU, who was building better roads, he was going to kill you. So you ended up taking the king's IOU and you ended up with better roads. 
Oh, terrible. Genghis Khan forced them, you know. And uh, but King Henry and few others have fought to emulate this example. But King Henry the First did it. So foreign traders, however, were able to insist on being paid with something less personal. They preferred commodity money containing precious metals whose real asset value was recognized across political borders. Marco Polo tells us that the Khan tried to pay him too in bark currency, but he managed to get away with some real money and his life. <laughs> As if he couldn't spend the bark in all of Asia while Genghis was in charge. So I said, imagine calling a piece of yellow rock real money and the king's iou for the bridge or road he just built for me as not real money keith's really got the worth of local and national monies backward 